Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Today, we're all about Brooklyn. We're streaming from Brooklyn today. We got Tony Gale in the house, live from Brooklyn. What's happening? How are you doing today? I'm well. How are you? Doing absolutely wonderful. It's a it's a breezy 60 degrees. You can't you can't ask for anything better. <laughs> I love this kind of weather. It's perfect. Maybe a light jacket in the morning and the evening. That's fantastic. It. As long as as long as you stand in that right area of the sun, you get that nice, beautiful heat. I love it. I love it. But uh, for those of you who don't know, Tony's here with part two of this four-part series, talking intro to photography. So today we're tackling camera basics. So have questions about that, get them in. If you're joining us here on Zoom, use the Q&A tab. If you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, you can use the comment section. Before I hand it over to Tony, just want to say a quick thanks to our sponsors over at Sony. Thanks so much to them for sponsoring this event. And as always, thanks to Tony for being here. We love having him here. It's a pleasure to see him. So I'm going to hand over the reins to him. Thanks again for being here. And I'll see you back in a little while. All right. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. I am Tony Gale. I'm a Sony artist of imagery. And as Scott said, Today is part two of our series, mostly covering settings and exposure. I'm a Sony artisan of imagery. As always, thank you to Sony for having me and the b &H event space. I'm also a BenQ ambassador, a Manfrotto ambassador in x right Colorado. Coming up, we have parts three and four of this, composition on November 1st and lighting on November 15th. So if this is helpful, you can check those out. If it's not helpful, you can still check them out or or not, whatever makes you happy. Uh, I'm a commercial photographer based in New York, mostly people in portraits, editorial, corporate, and advertising. I started in the 90s. When I started in the 90s, digital wasn't a thing. We all shot film. You wanted to do a selfie, you could put your camera on a log like this and hope for the best. Pre-focus, hope you were right. Now with what we have available to us, with the digital technology, just with the tools in general, it's absolutely incredible. It's a fantastic time to be a photographer. We're able to do things that just wouldn't be possible. For those of you who are learning, which I assume is most of you if you're watching this, it's a great time to be learning photography because you're able to do things and experiment and try things out in a way that just wasn't possible before. When I was starting out, I'd take some pictures, experiment a little, process the film, wait till the film's processed, you take a look, maybe it worked, maybe it didn't, maybe it came close to working, but you can't test and try and test and try in the moment. There was always that delay, plus it was expensive processing all that film. So we are in a very fortunate time to be able to do what we do. Uh, a couple of things also before we start, next week, Sony has the creative space in New York City. If you're in New York or nearby, it's a free event on Thursday and Friday. You can register on alphauniverse.com slash creative space. I will be leading a photo walk on that Friday. And on the Thursday, B&H, our good friends at B&H, are hosting a party at the creative space. I believe all that information should either be on creative space or the B&H event space. Also, Sony has recently launched community forums. So if you're part of Facebook forums or Reddit groups or something about Sony or photography, and you're looking for something that maybe is nicer, kinder people. Not that there aren't kind people on Reddit and Facebook, but sometimes there are unkind people. Um, you can go to Alpha Universe, community.alphauniverse.com, and there are brand new forums. They've just started. So far, everybody's very, very nice. All right. Today, I'm going to be covering the photo basics, settings, exposure, which includes ISO shutter speed and aperture. I'll touch on bracketing, talk about white balance, talk about focusing, talk about the difference between JPEG and RAW. And we'll just go from there. One tricky thing when you're, especially when you're doing an intro basic class like this, for some of you, some of what I'm going to say is going to be perhaps more advanced than you were expecting. And for some of you, it may be less advanced than you were expecting. If it's more advanced, please ask questions. If there's something you don't understand, please reach out and ask the question. Um, or 
this is all being recorded and you can watch it again. Uh, if it's not advanced enough for you, hopefully the next topic we cover will be. So on your camera, or if you've got like a Sony Xperia in your uh, Pro Photo app, you have some settings. Most of the cameras that I'm gonna be talking about directly are Sony cameras, obviously, because I shoot Sony and I'm a Sony artisan. However, all of these things in broad strokes will apply to any camera you have. If you have a camera that you got from your grandfather that's been living in a basement for 50 years and only shoots film, some of these settings, many of what I'm talking about will apply, some of it won't. It won't shoot video, for example. <clears throat> but whatever you shoot with, a lot of what we're covering will apply. When I get into specifics, like things in the menu, that's more Sony specific, but you should have something similar on anything you shoot with. And as much as I love Sony, and I do think Sony is the best camera for almost everybody, you know what? If you're out there taking pictures, that's fantastic, whatever you're using. So your camera is typically going to have manual, shutter priority, aperture priority, program, video, and auto. We're gonna talk about that in more depth. We're gonna talk about the exposure triangle, ISO, aperture, and f-stop. To start with, here's a command dial, the control dial on a Sony camera. On the left is an A6000. On the right is an Alpha 7 R3, I believe. There's a lot of things on here. Most of them duplicate, not all. It depends on your camera. So M means manual. Manual means you're, you're controlling the shutter speed and the aperture and choosing those specifically. S is shutter priority. That means you're setting your shutter speed and the camera's figuring out an f-stop or an aperture. Aperture priority, you're picking an f-stop. The camera's figuring out the shutter. P for program, the camera's figuring them both out. Video looks like a little film strip. You can shoot video in any of these settings. What setting it to video will do is it will pre-crop to 16 by 9 and make a couple other things available in the menu, perhaps, that otherwise wouldn't be there until you're actually shooting the video. Auto means the camera will do everything. It will do auto ISO, auto aperture, auto, sh auto shutter speed. All of this will be explained more in a little bit. And auto is what I tell people when you first get a camera, if you're not familiar with photography and maybe you've been taking pictures with your phone, and there's all these settings and everybody tells you professionals only shoot in manual, which is not true. Uh, I often shoot in manual. If I'm shooting with strobes, I am always shooting in manual. But if I'm walking around or the light's changing, I'm not shooting in manual. <clears throat> and anything that anybody says everybody does is probably not true. But auto is the break glass in case of emergency. Nothing's going right. You just want to take a picture. You can put it in auto. Uh, some Sony APS-C cameras have an intelligent auto, which sort of takes a few pictures and balances them out. I've never used it, but that's what that is. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's regular auto. Superior auto is the one that, that takes several pictures and balances them out. You also may have a scene mode. That's typically on an APS-C camera, not a full frame camera. That's where you might say, I'm photographing sports or I'm photographing a landscape or a still life or a, a macro. And you can set that and the camera will automatically select settings <clears throat> that it thinks will optimize for that. So for example, if you put it on sports, it will typically select a high shutter speed to freeze the motion. You also may have on APS-C or older Sony full-frame cameras, a sweet panorama mode. Your phone might have that. That is where... Here's a picture, looks fine. Here's a sweet panorama where I'm physically moving the camera, sweeping it. It's taking multiple pictures and stitching them together in camera. Your phone may do it. Uh, depending on your camera, it may do it. On a Sony Alpha 6400, a typical picture is 6,000 by 4,000 pixels, the one on the top here. Sweet panorama in this instance was 8,192 pixels by 1856. So it's not as high, but about 25% wider 
Sweet panorama is cool. It does limit you to just JPEG. You can't do a sweet panorama that's raw, um, but it can be cool. You also have a memory recall setting. So you can set certain things, go to MR, memory recall, and it just automatically brings those settings back. On some of the newer full frame cameras, you have slow and quick. Slow and quick is a video setting where you can shoot slow motion or quick motion. And then you have three memory settings. Instead of just memory recall, you have three on most of the newer full frame cameras. Also, if you're on the newest cameras like the Alpha 7 IV, some of these things, instead of being on the top dial or on the side, so slow and quick video and stills, is a secondary thing that's on this dial, but on the second part, but I don't have a picture of it. As I mentioned, all of that may sound intimidating. You wanna go out, you wanna take pictures. There is nothing wrong with going in auto. Start there if nothing is working, or if you've started trying to control everything and it's just getting worse, green auto. So let's talk about exposure because we need to do that to talk about what aperture shutter Aperture priority, shutter priority, manual, what the aperture is, what the f-stop is. Exposure is a photo with the correct amount of light to appear right or accurate is a good exposure. So the reason right and accurate are in quotes there is because everything is subjective. Like maybe the picture I want is brighter than the picture you want. Is one of us right and one of us wrong? Not necessarily. If you're happy with what you got, then you did it right. And if you're not happy with it, then you did it wrong. So there is, if you really get into it, there is a, a correct exposure based on a gray card. If you, you, know, you can use a light meter or use a light meter in your camera and hold it up to a gray card. And if that's right in the middle, that is what is considered correct by your camera. But you might want it brighter or darker. So a good exposure is the one that makes you happy. One of the big advantages of mirrorless cameras in particular is that unless you turn it off, when you're looking through the viewfinder or at the screen, you're seeing what the camera is seeing. So you know if the exposure looks bright or dark. If it looks good there, it's probably good. With a DSLR or an SLR from back in the day, you would look through, you're looking at a mirror, you're seeing the world as it is, but you're not seeing the world as the camera sees it. So it was very easy to think everything was set correctly and make something that was too bright or too dark. I have certainly done that many of times. So a correct exposure, the correct amount of light, that sounds easy, except that there are different things that come into play because the correct amount of light varies based on other things. You have ISO. Back in the day, we called it ASA. There was also DIN. ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. Also, I know that some people prefer ISO. It just seems wrong to me. Even if it's right, it, it feels wrong. I still say ISO. It's your, sen your camera's sensitivity to light. So a low ISO, let's say 50, means that your camera is less sensitive to light. So if it's brighter, um, it's fine. But if it's dark, an ISO of 50 is going to be tough. And as you get up in ISO, you're more likely to get noise. You're going to get digital noise just because the heat and who knows what. It's a little bit like if you have a really good stereo system, which I realize is a little bit of thing in the past, but I'm looking at mine right here. When you turn up the volume really high, the audio still sounds good, right? On a good system, it sounds good. In your car, maybe if you have a good phone or a good headphones, you turn it up, it sounds good. If you have bad headphones or a bad stereo or bad speakers in your car, you turn it up, it sounds bad, right? It gets scratchy and crackly. ISO is a similar thing on cameras. With a better camera, you can put the ISO up higher and still have acceptable results than with a less good camera. Some of that too is the technology has improved over time. So the best camera from 15 years ago is probably not as good as one of the cheapest newer cameras that's available today. Obviously it would depend on the camera and I can't say that that's the case 100% of the time, but in general, a newer camera is probably gonna be better than an older camera of similar tiers. So ISO, camera sensitivity to light. 
Then you have your aperture, which is the size of the opening in the lens, and your shutter speed, which is how much time the camera is exposed to light. So all of these things work together, not in isolation. If you change your ISO, it changes your exposure. If you want a lower ISO because you want less noise, and so you change your ISO to a lower number, but you don't compensate with either your aperture or your f-stop. I'm sorry, your F aperture and your f-stop are the same thing. With your aperture or your shutter speed, it's just going to be too dark. Same thing, if you want to photograph a bird in flight, for example, you want to freeze that motion so you increase your shutter speed, but you don't let your ISO and your aperture change, everything's going to be too dark. And the same thing in reverse, maybe you want a shallower depth of field. Maybe you want to photograph something and have the background be all blurry, so you make your f-stop uh, larger, a lower number. We'll go over all of this in more detail. Now it's going to be too bright unless you compensate with your ISO or your shutter speed. So exposure is often described in stops. One stop is equal to a doubling or halving of the light. So a shutter speed of 1 25th to 2 50th is a one stop. 1 25th to 1, to 1 over 60 is one stop, even though it would really be 1 over 62 and a half. It's not. You know, F8 to 11 is one stop. F8 to 5.6 is one stop. ISO 100 to 200 is one stop. 100 to 50 is one stop. It can be a little weird. Your camera probably does thirds of a stop. So F8 to 11 is one stop. It will do two in between. Older cameras and sometimes on newer cameras, if you set it that way, it will do half stops. So. We talked about how everything works together. So here, for example, is a bucket of 100, 100 exposure points, which isn't a thing. You need some ISO, you need some shutter speed, you need some aperture. They all need to equal 100 to get a good exposure. So they can all be roughly the same, like on the top, or you could have more shutter and less ISO, or you could have more aperture and less ISO and somewhere in between with shutter. You can combine those three things, but they all change together. So the camera's at sensitivity to light, like I said, it's the ISO. A lower ISO number is a lower sensitivity to, to light, but typically more dynamic range and less noise and grain. Dynamic range is the amount of information you can get from your brightest brights to your darkest darks. If you increase your ISO, typically that gets compressed. So if you're photographing something with a lot of contrast, a lower ISO may help you. And I mentioned thirds of a stop. So in ISO, 50, 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, those are full stops. And then in between 50 to 100, you have 64 and 80 or 125 and 160 between 100 and 200. Those are thirds of a stop. Your camera, like I said, probably does thirds of a stop unless you've changed it in the menu. And that number can go up however far. Something like the Alpha 7 S3 can go up to 400,000, for example, which is pretty high. The fastest film I ever found went up to 3,200. So it's a lot, lot more sensitivity to light. All right, so I explained how everything works in tandem, but here's a little bit of something to get a sense of it. So you can see... We've got shutter speed at the top, 1 15th, 1 30th, 1 60th, et cetera. And then we have ISO on the left, 100, 200, 800, 3200. Everything is shot in an Alpha 7 R4 at F16. You can see that if you sort of file, follow things in a little bit of a diagonal, that it changes, right? So ISO 100 at a 15th of a second, it's too dark, but ISO 100 at a 500th of a second is way too dark. You go up to 3200, it's too bright, even though the shutter speed stayed the same and the f-stop stayed the same. So the ISO affects your exposure, just like everything else does. ISO also can be affected by noise, and depending on how you're going to use it, you may not see a difference. So this is from the roof of my apartment in Brooklyn a range of ISOs, when they're small, 
everything's fine. When it gets bigger, you may start seeing a difference depending. So ISO 50 on the left, then 400, 3200, 6400. If you look, especially in the sky, you can see a little bit more noise, uh, sort of digital grain as we go up in ISO. But the magic of modern cameras is even the 6400 looks good. It's absolutely amazing what we can do. But if being as clean as possible is your goal, you want a lower number. There are times when you don't have a choice. So for example, this was at Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. You're not allowed to use a tripod. So I couldn't use a long shutter speed. And we'll talk about shutter speeds again. Um, so everything has to be handheld. So ISO 6400 handheld at a tenth of a second with a 16 millimeter lens, 16 to 35 f4. It looks pretty good. All right, that's ISO. Hopefully nobody's brain has frozen yet. Then we have aperture, also known as your f-stop, which is the size of the lens opening. It refers to the ratio of the size of that opening to the focal length of the lens. Here's a Sony 135GM at f22. So you can see, looking at the lens, that that opening is quite small, right? It's letting in less light. Here it is at f8. It's larger, letting in more light. Here it is at 1.8. You can't see the shutter blades any, or the uh, aperture blades anymore because the entire thing is open. So lower number lets in more light, larger opening. Higher number lets in less light, smaller opening. A larger number with a smaller opening is a greater depth of field. Depth of field is how much is in focus from foreground to background. And the converse, a lower number with a larger opening is a more shallow depth of field. So less is in focus. If you think of it, you know, sometimes if you can't quite see and you squint your eyes a little bit and everything gets a tiny bit sharper, it's the same effect. You're making... Uh, essentially the apertures of your eyes, your irises a little bit smaller. By doing that, you're letting in less light, makes everything just a little bit sharper. Or if you really want to get pedantic, acceptably sharp. It's not actually making everything in focus. It's just making things ex appear acceptably in focus. So aperture is a little weirder. A full stop in numbers is not a, does not double the number. So F1 to 1.4 is one stop. 142 is one stop, 2 to 28 is one stop, 28 to 4 is one stop, with corresponding thirds of a stop in between. I just noticed that uh, I said F1.8 F twice between 1.4 and 2. That's not true. Um, I think it's 1.6 and 1.8. So you've got thirds of a stop, same thing as before, opening up a third of a stop. So letting in a third of a stop more light by making your aperture larger will have the same effect on your exposure as making your ISO one third of a stop higher. So if you go from 100 to 125 on ISO, it's the same effect as going from five, six to five on aperture. They're both letting in one third more light or <clears throat> rather increasing the exposure by one third. So I mentioned F-stop and depth of field. So this is the 135, 1.8 with a range of apertures to get a sense of depth of field. So upper left, 1.8, lower right, F22. You can see on the upper right or upper left that it's focused just on the leading edge of that board. And everything else is so out of focus as to be completely lost as to what it is. And then as it goes, 1.8, 2, 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22, you can see you get more and more information. It gets sharper and sharper back there. That's what depth of field is. It changes, though, if you're close or far from your subject. So here I'm quite close. Difference between the two. Here I'm focused on something further away. If you focus close, your, app, your depth of field is more shallow than if you focus further away. So focusing same spot, just further down at more towards that door handle. The difference between 1.8 and F22 you can see even at 1.8, there's a little more information back there. And at F22, there's a lot more. So if you focus on something very far away, 
So here, for example, I'm focused on that F that West 24th Street sign. F4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22. Looking at this size, you don't really see a difference in depth of field because I'm focused so far away, the difference in depth of field becomes meaningless. It's also affected by the uh, focal length of your lens. So a wider lens will have a greater depth of field or perception of depth of field than a longer lens. So a 12 millimeter lens compared to 200 millimeter lens, the depth of field will feel very different. There are reasons to do both, right? So maybe you like a shallow depth of field. This was a portrait I did a couple of years ago, shot at 1.8. There's this wall in the foreground that I liked, but I didn't want to see any detail. I just sort of like foreground elements. So I shot at 1.8 so that it's there. It adds some interest. He's sharp and then the background goes soft. If it was too sharp back there, it draws more attention than I would like. You know, the focus is on him. Maybe you like sun stars. Typically, you're going to want to stop down as far as you can. Maybe you want as much in focus as possible. So I've got Snoqualmie Falls in Washington State back there. I want that sharp. I want the foreground sharp. This photo to me, if the background is out of focus, is not as compelling. So F22. F-stop is one of those things like almost everything in photography, however, that's subjective. If you are someone who wants to shoot wide open so that your background is out of focus all the time, fantastic, you should do that. If you're someone who wants everything in focus all the time, so you want to shoot at 16 or 22, fantastic, you should do that too. There's times when maybe most of us would agree that compositionally one or the other is better. Uh, but if you love something, if you love the way a photo looks and someone else says, oh, I think it should have been done differently. You know, you can listen to them. It's good to get feedback. It's good to get criticism. Um, but you don't have to agree with them. If you like how it looks, then you like how it looks. So shutter speed is how long the camera shutter is open. A longer duration of shutter speed lets in more light. A shorter duration of shutter speed lets in less light. So you can sort of think of it as if you go into a dark room and you turn on the light switch, the amount of time the light is on is your shutter speed. If it's on longer, more light comes in. If it's on shorter, less light comes in. In your camera, typically, you're going to have 30 seconds at the longest that you can set it to. And then the fastest shutter speed it will do might be a 4,000th, could be an 8,000th, or it could be a 32,000th. Most of the Sony APA. SC cameras, one four thousandth is the max. Most of the full frame, it's going to be one eight thousandth. And then in electronic shutter, something like the Alpha One or the Alpha Nine or Nine Two can do a thirty two thousandth of a second, which is ridiculously fast. Um, I keep trying to come up with a use for that, and I haven't yet. But I'm sure that there are some people who've done some super cool stuff. You also typically have a bulb setting, which is B. Bulb is the shutter will stay open as long as you keep it open. So <clears throat> if you're going to use that, typically you want to use a cable release. You just hit it, lock the cable release. It stays open until you close it. That's typically just limited by your battery life. So if you've got a full charge, it could be a couple hours. If you've got uh, an adapter so that you're using the USB power and you're plugged into a wall, it could be a couple of days. Um, it's as long as you want it to be, that's bulb setting. There's a lot of other things that come into play with shutter speed, though, besides just the amount of light it lets in. Like when I had my first camera, there was a little sort of matchstick thing in the viewfinder, and you just wanted that in the middle, and you had a good exposure. And I didn't understand or know what changing the f-stop or the shutter speed really did. So I would just change the dials until it was in the middle. I didn't pay attention to the fact that the shutter speed was maybe too slow or that the f-stop wasn't going to be ideal. I just wanted to get that little line in the middle. So there are other things that come into play. There's something called the reciprocal rule, which is nothing's really a rule, but one over your focal length when handheld. So what that means is, let's say you have a 50 millimeter lens, 
you want your shutter speed to be one over 50 or faster to get a sharp image. If you have a 200 millimeter lens, one over 200. If you have a 20 millimeter lens, one over 20. In general, for most people, that will get you something fairly sharp. With the newer cameras and image stabilization, the optical steady shot in Sony cameras, especially the cameras where it's in the body and the lens is fantastic and can get you several stops, more stabilization or more hand holdability than you could with just the reciprocal rule. But in general, for most people, you want to keep at one over your focal length. There are people who can handhold much lower. And there are people, you know, maybe you've got a little bit of a tremor. Maybe the lens is really heavy and you've been holding it all day. So your handshake a little, maybe you're just tired. And maybe that one over 50 for a 50 millimeter lens isn't enough. You want to just be aware of that and see what works for you. Image stabilization is great though. So this is the path station on 34th street, all handheld with image stabilization off. So we've got 1 60th of a second on the left. This is all at 24 millimeters. 1 30th in the middle, 1 15th, 1 8th, 1 quarter, 1 half, 1 second. So the first couple, it's probably fine, especially looking at it this size, but you can see if you, especially if you look at the half or the 1 second, it's starting, the 1 second in particular, you can see it's not as sharp because I'm a human being, and no matter how hard I try, I cannot hold a camera still for one second. All of these, I shot three or four frames at each of the exposures, and I picked the sharpest frame from that batch. If you're pushing it with shutter speed, shoot several frames. I, a couple of years ago, thought I was a genius and came up with the idea that I should put the camera into high speed and shoot you know, five frames a second or 10 frames a second where you, you can shoot a burst by just by holding down the shutter because physically hitting the shutter shakes the camera. I'm like, that's a great idea. Why has no one thought of that? Um, and then I was watching YouTube and found an old Tony Northrup video where they talked about that exact same thing and realized that, yeah, you, you know, you come up with good ideas. You think you're so smart and you know, maybe you are for coming up with it, but other people came up with it too. Um, so one second, probably too long. What else works for you? That's up to you. So to give you a better sense, this is 1 60th on the top, one half second on the bottom. And you can see, like if you look at the MetroCard path stickers on the things, you can see half a second, they're pretty blurry. You can tell what they are, but it's not sharp. Or the grate on the fence there. 60th, it did pretty well. With shutter two, though, you have the issue of not just your motion, but your subject's motion. So if what you're photographing isn't moving, then the only thing you need to think about is, can you hold the camera steady enough to get something sharp? If what you're photographing is moving, then that speed comes into play. So here we have 15th, 30th, 60th, 125th, 250th, et cetera. At a 15th of a second, everything's pretty blurry when it's moving. 30 is still blurry, 60 is still blurry, but less blurry. And you can see it get progressively sharper. Of these, which is right and which is wrong is extremely subjective. Sometimes you want it frozen sharp. For example, I mentioned birds in flight before. A lot of people that like to photograph birds, they want them sharp, right? It's hard to tell what bird it is if it's too blurry. On the other hand, maybe you like the feeling of motion in the city from the cars zipping by. Uh, maybe you photograph auto racing and sometimes, depending on your angle, like here, all of these cars were moving. They're all driving through. I waited until the light had changed and it wasn't the first car. It was everybody going, you know, 25, 30 miles an hour. But looking at this, the 500, 1,000, 2,000, you would look at this and for all you know, the car is just parked in the crosswalk, right? There's no way to know it's moving. Whereas it's something like 160 or 125th, where there's just a hint of blur, you get the feeling of motion. So which of those serves your purposes is up to you, but it's something to keep in mind. You also have things like the classic milky waterfall shot. 
one eighth of a second on the left, one one hundredth of a second on the right, but you can see the f-stop changed because the ISO didn't. Which of those is your goal is up to you. Most people that photograph waterfalls want the uh, sort of silky smooth look of the left, but sometimes on the right where you get that tension and the activity and the the sort of different feeling of seeing the water breaking up that way and getting the sharpness can be cool too. So whichever is works for you is what works for you. There is no right or wrong answer. If you're going to go for the long shutter speed with a waterfall though, you may need a neutral density filter. You might want a long shutter speed because you're going to photograph stars or nighttime. This was a couple of years ago in Yellowstone, Old Faithful at night, the comet Neowise in the background, stars in the sky. 13 seconds at f2.5 with a 24 GM and an alpha 7 R4. Or 25 hundredth of a second at a Padres game out in San Diego a few years ago with a 70 to 200 f4G and a 6300. 25 hundredth of a second. He's mid swing. You can see a tiny bit of blur on the ball, very little on the bat. But because of the tension, you know he's moving. Nobody poses like this. Sometimes fast is good. Sometimes slow is good. Sometimes slow is good. Outside Penn Station, lots of blurry. You also have, with your shutter, electronic or mechanical. If you're on a modern camera, you, you will have electronic or mechanical shutter. Um, electronic shutter is what your phone probably has. It's not a physical shutter. It's the shutter itself charging and turning off. Um, electronic shutter will allow you to go to a much faster shutter speed with that, something like the alpha one, you can do 30 frames a second in electronic shutter or a hundred mechanical, or I'm not a hundred or 10 in mechanical because the mecha mechanical shutter is limited by the mechanics, right? Physical things have to move. So 30 frames a second would be quite hard with a mechanical shutter with an electronic shutter. It can be done. Um, you do sometimes get some banding if you're under crazy light with electronic shutter, depending on the readout speed. So with a fast camera with a fast readout speed, you're less likely to get that. But if you've ever photographed something in electronic shutter where there's dark and light lines, that's banding from the light itself flickering and the way that the shutter reads seeing that, that's less likely to happen in mechanical. Not impossible, however. Electronic shutter is typically silent. Uh, your camera may have sounds that it makes, but you can turn those off. So if you're photographing something where you want to make no noise, electronic shutter is the way to go. Uh, if you're using flash, you're probably going to want to use mechanical shutter. Uh, some cameras like the Alpha One at some shutter speeds can do flash with electronic shutter. But for the most part, most cameras, you're going to need mechanical shutter for flash. All right, let's talk about bracketing. So you, you feel good, you understand all those things that impact your exposure, but you're not sure what a good exposure is going to be. So you can bracket. Bracketing is just changing your settings to have a range of exposures. So here we are, longer shutter speed on the left, medium shutter speed in the middle, shorter shutter speed on the right. I've got a range of exposures. Which one is gives you what you want? That's up to you. If you're just not sure what you want, bracket. You can typically do that. Um, in your drive menu, you'll have a bracket setting. With Sony cameras, you can do three three frames as uh, three frame bracket, five frame bracket, uh, all the way up to five uh, five stops. I think it's five, maybe it's three stops. But you can do a huge range. So this, for example, huge range of brackets. If you want to do something like HDR, it's a good way to do it. One thing to keep in mind if you do auto bracketing, where you tell the camera to control the bracket as opposed to controlling it directly yourself, is that when you bracket, it will change your shutter speed. So I don't know if you can tell here on the very blown out one on the right with the very long shutter speed that it's a little blurry because the shutter speed was so, was so long that it wasn't sharp. All right, you also, have all that. You've got all that for exposure to think about. But the color of the light, the white balance of the camera also matters. Most of the time, auto white balance is going to be fine, but not always. White balance is the color of light the camera sees in as neutral. So 
if you're inside at your grandmother's house with incandescent lights and it's all orange, that's a warmer light than outside during the middle of the day with daylight, which is a bluer light. Your camera is usually pretty good at figuring that out, but you can tell it what to do. So typical Sony camera, you've got, or any camera really, you've got a huge range, white daylight, auto, shade, cloudy, different fluorescence, incandescent, flash, custom. You can also go in and really change it. You've got your green magenta shift, your AB shift. You can change your Kelvin temperature. You can do all that as well, depending on how specific you want to get. I typically will shoot an auto white balance, but I will shoot a gray card, and that allows me to correct it later. Uh, if I'm shooting video, I will always do a custom white balance. This is an example of what white balance might look like under different circumstances. So this is an old Apple barn upstate New York. Everything's the same except the white balance. So auto white on the upper left, daylight, shade, cloudy, fluorescent, warm white, fluorescent, cool white. You can see the whole thing. Auto white did pretty well. Daylight did pretty well. Shady makes the shade less blue than it is on the auto white or the daylight. But the sun on the side of the barn is warmer. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe it's not. You get into fluorescent warm white and things like that, and it looks terrible. You can also change the color temperature, 2,500, terrible. You also have a situation like this. So I have on the left a strobe, which is daylight balanced, on our left. And on our right, I have an incandescent light, which is tungsten balanced or incandescent balanced. So roughly 5,500 degrees Kelvin on our left, roughly 3,200 degrees Kelvin on our right. You can see these different white balance settings. So auto sort of does its best to mix the two. Daylight is correctly giving the color for the left side of my face, but the right side of my face is warm. The incandescent is getting closer on the right side of my face, but because some of the light's bouncing around, it's not right. Daylight turning off the flash to warm. Incandescent, incandescent turning off the flash up yeah, in the ballpark. Incandescent with just flash, too cold. Daylight with just flash, pretty good. And then daylight again on the lower right with everything. That's why you can you may want to specifically change your white balance. Because the circumstances you're shooting in are something specific and you want to control that. You don't want to do a portrait of somebody and have them look blue like I do here. You probably don't want them to look as warm as I do with the daylight port, uh, daylight white balance with the incandescent light. You can control all that. This is less important if you're shooting raw because you can always fix it later. If you're shooting JPEG, it's very important because there's just less to fix and there are things that you just can't fix with the JPEG. Trying to correct the white balance with the JPEG works to a point, but not great. Similar thing here, maybe you're not photographing people. Same path station. Auto white, daylight, shade, cloudy, tungsten, custom. You can see none of these are really right. <coughs> the custom and the auto white are pretty close, but tungsten, not right, because it's crazy fluorescence. Daylight, shade, cloudy, not right at all. Every situation is different. If you really, really want to get nerdy, the x right color, well, now it's the, it changed the name. But the color checker passport is fantastic. You can get the great card. You can do a custom white balance. All right. We've talked about aperture, shutter speed, ISO, white balance. Now we're going to talk about focusing. So you have autofocus S, which is single shot. You have autofocus A, which is auto. You have autofocus C, which is continuous. You have direct manual focus and you have manual focus. Again, if you're not shooting with a Sony camera, you're going to have something similar. It may be called something different, but you should have all of these settings. The terminology might be slightly different. Single shot, continuous, manual, auto. Um, single shot means that it focuses and then that focus doesn't change until you hit the shutter again. So, in, sometimes that's fine, but if you're shooting at, say, five or 10 frames a second, this gentleman running towards me, 
focused on him there. Now he's closer. Because I'm shooting in a burst mode, he's way out of focus, really out of focus. Because AFS focused on him when I first hit the shutter and then the focus doesn't change. Sometimes that's good if you're photographing things that aren't moving or things are moving and you don't want the focus to change. Automatic autofocus changes between AFS and AFC depending on what the camera thinks. Um, I don't ever use AFA. Continuous autofocus constantly changes your focus to track your subject. So here, same thing. He's running towards us, still in focus, still in focus, still in focus. His hand's a little blurry, but his torso where it was focused is in focus. So AFC will track the focus as whatever it's focused on moves. I am in AFC about 95% of the time. Every once in a while, I'll do AFS or manual focus, but almost always continuous autofocus because I photograph people. And if that person moves or I move, I want them to stay sharp. Uh, you also have autofocus area. Oh, and I skipped the direct manual focus and manual focus. Manual focus is you focus on what you want. Direct manual focus is a combination of autofocus, and then you can adjust the manual focus. Then you have autofocus area. You have wide. So here it is. It's focused on the whole area. It's picking what it wants to focus on based on the most of the area, almost all the way to the edges. So it's doing fine. Then you have zone, center, flexible spot, expanded flexible spot, tracking expanded flexible spot. Where this comes into play is here, for example, I've told it to focus on the gentleman on the left. So it's ignoring the person on the right for the focus, which works great there. But now I've told it to ignore the person on the left and I'm focusing on the person on the right using the tracking focus. You could also do it with zone. What this is useful for is if there's multiple things that might confuse the camera in the frame, you can say, track this, not that, and get it to focus on that. All right. Then we have JPEG and RAW, the great debate. Um, people sometimes get quite heated over whether or not you should shoot JPEG and RAW, just like some people should say professionals only shoot manual. People say professionals only shoot RAW. I'd say most commercial photographers only shoot raw. Um, a lot of photojournalists shoot JPEG. A lot of sports photographers shoot JPEG. I shoot almost exclusively raw, unless there's a really compelling reason not to. Uh, but shoot what works for you. What raw gives you is more flexibility, it takes up more space, and it slows things down, but it gives you more flexibility. So you've got RAW, you've got JPEG. If you have a newer camera like the Alpha 1 or the Alpha 7 IV, it has HEIF as well, which is sort of like a JPEG, but higher quality. Um, with a HEIF, assuming I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, not everything can read it yet. So just bear that in mind. And then you also, of course, have uncompressed or compressed RAW. Um, with the newer cameras and newer firmware, you, you have full-size raw, medium raw, small raw. Compressed and uncompressed is all the raw information uncompressed, so nothing's been changed. Compressed is it's just sized down all that information a little bit. Um, most of the time, the overwhelming majority of the time, I see no difference. Uh, I will often shoot an uncompressed just because, but I think you're likely fine and compressed. With JPEG, you're going to have typically three different quality settings, extra fine, fine, and standard. Extra fine is the highest quality, then fine, then standard. If you're going to shoot in JPEG, I would really encourage you to do extra fine, get the highest quality you can. And then you have JPEG sizes, large, medium, and small. For me personally, and again, this is subjective and you should do what works for you. The only time I would ever use anything less than the highest quality JPEG in size or compression is if I was also shooting raw. If I was doing raw plus JPEG, because I need the JPEGs for some reason quickly, I might shoot small JPEG. Uh, but if I was only shooting JPEG, I would only ever use the highest quality. Um, one of the challenges, as I mentioned, there's more flexibility with raw than JPEG. So here is a very underexposed barn, unedited JPEG and raw. Here I've edited it brought up the highlights, tried not to let the, sh the 
I'm sorry, brought up the shadows. Try not to let the highlights on the tree go too bad. <clears throat> JPEG on the left, raw on the right. You know, it, it comes close, but if you look at the tree on the left, the highlights are sort of gray. Whereas on the right, the highlights feel more natural. Then you get something like this. This is a fancy apartment building near mine in Brooklyn. This is normal exposure. This is really overexposed. So that really overexposed one, I did raw plus JPEG. I did a raw conversion on the left to bring it back. It looks pretty good. On the right, the exact same edits as the raw. On the upper right is the JPEG, but the color is all wonky. Um, so I did some additional edits to get it closer on the lower right, but it's still nowhere near as good. Like the raw looks fine. The JPEG just couldn't recover in the same way. That's one of the reasons to shoot raw. But I, like I said, especially with what you see is what you get through a mirrorless camera. If you don't want to shoot raw, you know, do what works for you. All right. Let's see if there are any questions. There are. There are questions, Tony. Uh, well, I hope you have answers. I hope I hope I hope you weren't trying to get out of here early. <laughs> no. Uh Elizabeth asked, this is this is more related a little bit to uh editing, but okay. we could touch on it a little bit. Um she wanted to know some editing programs have a sharpening tool. Do you find that helpful when you've taken a picture in the right setting? I almost ever, I very, very rarely use sharpening. Um, I feel like the cameras and lenses I use are sharp enough. So the only times I ever sharpen things is if I screwed up and it's not in focus. But if it's really not in focus, nothing's going to save it. If it's a tiny bit out of focus, sometimes I'll use sharpening there, but very rare. Awesome. Well, that was it. That was the only question we got, but... I think that's because we were talking about a lot of settings and you do a great job. You do a really thorough job. You're, you got tons of information in there. If you got lost in there, go back and rewatch it on the replay. But Tony's one of the best at this. I'm stroking Tony's ego over here. Maybe, Aww. maybe I'm going to, maybe I'm going to hit him up for a loan later. No, <laughs> I've got 50 cents burning a hole in my pocket. <laughs> and, and back, you know, I was about to say that could buy me a honey bun, but then I realized that's, that's no longer the case. There's inflation now and those don't cost that anymore. So but it'll buy you thank half you very much. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate the offer. Um, right. We did get a question here. Um, I'm, I'm not going to pronounce your name correctly. So I apologize, but I will attempt it. I believe it's from soon. He, um, if I butchered that, I'm really sorry. I apologize. Um, but want to know, do you set up to uncompressed on your a seven R four? Yes. I, most of the time I'm in uncompressed raw just because hard drives are cheap. There you go. And you can get them from B and H and I, and I have. Shameless plug. Excellent. Well, Tony, I know we'll see you back here November 1st, correct? Uh, whatever that first slide, that slide said, that sounds right. If, if my memory serves me correctly, it, it would be November 1st. Um, November 15th after that, or perhaps maybe, I know Tony wasn't 100% sure, but maybe you'll see him if you, if you head over to that creative space for well, the free event. Right. Friday, I'll be there for sure. Thursday, right. I'm shooting all day, so it's iffy. Right. Exactly. So if you want to see Tony in person and you're in the area, check him out. He's a great guy. I like Tony. He's always well, fun thanks. to hang out with. Yeah. You know, I mean. Right back it, at you. It'd be really weird if I started talking bad about you in front of your face. But no, I do mean it. I do mean it. I do like Tony. He's great. And he's a great teacher. Um, I've had the pleasure of being with him on a bunch of different photo walks we've done together. So if you're interested, check it out. It'll be a good time. But thank you so much, Tony, for being here. We appreciate your time and all the valuable information. Always and a pleasure. Definitely. And definitely thanks to Sony for sponsoring this event. That's all the time we have for tonight. This has been another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Catch you next time. Thanks, everybody.